Welcome to this movie on statistical mechanics. I am Jos Thijssen and uh, this movie is part of a series I've made for students in the Delft the Technical University where I teach a statistical mechanics course. In this video I want to address the formulation of quantum statistics within the Grand Canonical Ensemble which turns out to be very convenient for that particular purpose. And in order to appreciate this uh, video it would be useful to watch first the previous one uh, which introduces uh, quantum many-body states and addresses the uh, statistical properties like Fermi statistics and Bose statistics because this uh, video is intended as a follow-up. And I hope it's useful and enjoyable. We want to set up quantum statistics and the most convenient ensemble we can use for that is the Grand Canonical Ensemble. And in some way that may be surprising because in quantum mechanics we are not used to systems in which the number of particles vary. What we do have are Hamiltonians for n particles like the one here, which first uh, describes particles that do not interact. And then there is an interaction term which I've written as one half times the sum over i and j and then there is an interaction potential little v which uh, depends on the distance between ri and rj so on the separation between particles i and j this already is quite a complicated problem even to solve in the ground state and as i've emphasized in a previous movie on st uh, quantum statistics usually usually we express the physics in terms of basis functions that are built from one particle orbitals and uh, these are usually the solutions to some non-interacting Hamiltonian. For example, the first part of this Hamiltonian. The uh, h have eigenorbitals and if we combine those into Slater determinants or in symmetrized, into symmetrized boson wave functions, then we have solutions to such a system. But the grand canonical ensemble says that we do not fix the number of particles. So what do we do? The Hilbert space of n particles can be written as the span of the uh, vectors which are the basis vectors of particle 1, the basis vectors for particle 2, etc. up to n. So this is the n particle Hilbert space. And now we introduce a new space which does not have a fixed number of particles and that's called the Fox space. And the Fox space is a direct sum of the Hilbert space of one particle plus the Hilbert space of two particles plus the Hilbert space of three particles, etc., etc., and then goes up to infinity. As the Fox space allows for any number of particles, it forms a convenient space for working in the grand canonical ensemble. Now a very convenient basis to work in is the basis of eigenstates of some independent particle Hamiltonian, a non-interacting particle Hamiltonian, and we call the orbitals of the particles chi. So we have a set of wave vectors, states chi j, and uh, these chi j, they span the first Hilbert space. So the second Hilbert space is spanned by chi j cross chi k. So this is the first particle, this is the second particle, and they both have each all the orbitals at their disposal. Well, you can do the same for h3, etc, etc. So for the basis of the Fox space, we could use a combination of the basis of h1, the basis of h2, the basis of h3, but it turns out convenient to reorganize these basis vectors in a more efficient way. And the way we do that is that we just put here an n1, and n1 is the number of particles that are in the state chi1. So n1 corresponds to chi1, and it just counts the number of particles that are in the state chi1. Similar for n2, etc. 
So we organize the basis vectors according to the uh, basis vectors of the one particle space and we just put here numbers which give the occupation of that state. Now this way of reorganizing the uh, basis vectors can be illustrated with a very nice example. Suppose we have a drawer cabinet like the one on the left and each drawer corresponds to a state chi j. So these uh, states are called orbitals or spin orbitals if they include spin degrees of freedom and here are the particles and we can put one particle in drawer one we can also put two particles in drawer one provided they are bosons and we can do this for any drawer so in this case we have put a particle in drawer one a particle in drawer number three this is and this is four five six etc we can carry on like this so always be aware have this picture in mind when you see this so-called fox space notation when you see the n1, n2, it just means I take the states, these are the drawers, I count the number of particles in each drawer, so I count the number of balls, and that is my n1, n2, etc. So to summarize, if we have this notation, n1, etc, nj, this means that nj particles go into drawer, the drawer should be read as a state, number j state is then chi j. Now we want to calculate the grand canonical partition function which we know is as we know is defined as the sum over all the particle numbers e to the power beta mu n and then we have here a canonical partition function and we assume now that the particles are non-interacting so that the energies are simply the sums of the one particle energies. So here you see the total energy which is the number of particles in state k times the energy of state k. If the particles would interact, the energy at level k or in state k would be, de would be depend on the occupation of the other states. We assume that that is not the case, so we have non-interacting particles. You should also note that there is a subscript n here with the numbers nj because here I have summed over all over the total particle numbers which can vary from 0 to 1 etc etc and then for each fixed n we can fill the levels with particles nj but they should add up to the capital N so that's what this means it means that a sum over j of nj is equal to n. And so instead of summing over all the particle numbers and then the way we can distribute uh, that number of particles over the different drawers, we can also sum in a different way. We can also sum first over the number of particles in drawer 1 between 0 and infinity if they would be bosons. For fermions obviously we cannot put more than one particle in uh, state number 1. Then there is a sum, and 2 is 0 to infinity, and so on and so on, and j, 0 to infinity. And then it's very convenient to work out this partition function, because the, the integrand can be written as follows. We first have this factor, and if we use this, the factor, the n should be the sum of the little n j's, we can write this as beta mu sum j and j and then we have an e to the power minus beta the sum of a k and k epsilon k now if we work out this sum then there will be here an n1 and also there there will be an n1 uh, so this is a product of terms and the first term is, involves the n1 and the same for here so we can move all the terms which depend only on n1 to the sum over n1 etc here we have done that so we have put all the dependencies on n1 with the sum over n1 and the same for n2 and you see that all these sums 
become strikingly similar and we have an infinite series of these, uh, infinite sequence of these sums. They're all multiplied by each other. And so if we use the product sign, we can write it as a product over j and then the sum over nj going from zero to infinity in principle, uh, then e to the power beta mu minus epsilon j and j. But I have already mentioned several times that the sum cannot always go to infinity because if we are dealing with fermions, we cannot put more than one particle in a state. So suppose we are dealing with fermions, what would this sum uh, and product reduce to? Well, we have just two terms in the sum. There's one with nj0, in that case we have one, and we have one with nj is one, and we obtain e to the power of beta mu minus epsilon j. So this is the case of for fermions. So what will we get if we are dealing with bosons? Well, we have an infinite sum over something to the power mj, and that's a geometric series, and I can immediately write up the result. That's 1 over 1 minus e to the power of beta mu minus epsilon j, so that's the case for bosons, and the bosons are subject to a very important condition because we can only evaluate this geometric series if the number which is raised to the power of j is itself smaller than 1. So we should have that mu minus epsilon j is smaller than 1, smaller than 0, sorry. It is interesting to consider how many particles there are in a particular state. So nk is the expectation value for the particles in state k. And we can evaluate that straightforwardly from the probability factor that we have used above. So here is the expression. In the numerator, we have this probability factor. So we have a probability distribution with, which is given by all these factors for a particular configuration of n i and j's. We sum over all the possibilities for all these n k's in this case. And then we put here an extra n k because that's the guy we want to have the expectation value of. And in order to normalize, we need to uh, divide by the probability distribution summed over all the possibilities for all the n j's. And now we see that evaluating this expression is not so difficult because here we have a product of terms. Also in the denominator we have a product of terms and we see that this term cancels against that one. The second term cancels against the second term in the numerator. There is only one term which does not cancel and that's precisely this term with the nk because it has an nk in the numerator but not in the denominator. So the result is surprisingly simple. It is this expression which only involves the k, and because we have already worked out this sum, it's now convenient to work this out using the usual procedure where we write this as a d, d beta epsilon k, or we can also use a beta mu from the logarithm of the denominator, which is this sum over k e to the power of beta mu minus epsilon k and k. And we have worked out this guy above. So here you see the result for fermions, it's just this term, and for bosons we have this term. And if you put that in, it's very easy to find the final result. For fermions, we had for this expression here, the 1 plus e to the power beta mu minus epsilon j. So if we take the logarithm and then the uh, derivative, we get this expression, which gives us the so-called Fermi-Dirac distribution function.
and we proceed in a similar fashion for bosons and we get the so-called Bose-Einstein distribution. And that's the main result of this derivation. However, for completeness it is interesting to compare what we have just done with the Belt-Maxwell-Boltzmann counting. And we expect the greatest difference for the uh, Fermi versus the Maxwell-Boltzmann because Fermi allows only for one particle at most in a level and with Maxwell-Boltzmann that can be infinite. So the most interesting case is the comparison with the boson counting. So let's look again at the original Psi states, a state Psi which describes particles with coordinates x1 to xn is given by this expression and it's one of the square root of n factorial then we sum over all the possible permutations we get we look at the we consider the permutation sign and uh, the epsilon p for bosons that would be zero it would be one always And it's important to note that we have included this factor of 1 over square root n factorial, which in the case of bosons does not give us the proper normalization of the states. So we see that with proper boson counting, we get this number. If we would just take Maxwell-Boltzmann counting, so pretending that the particles are uh, indistinguishable in, in would mean that if there are more than one particle in the same state and we would swap it we could get a new state so in that case we would just get for the norm one therefore we see that actually the states are counted with a weight factor of 1 over nj factorial for each level j, j in comparison to the correct uh, boson counting. So this is correct boson counting and this is Maxwell-Boltzmann counting. So let's go back to this expression. So this factor of 1 over nj factorial accounts for this di difference in counting the states. And if we use that factor it's easy to see that this is the expansion of a exponential function and the uh, number that we are expanding is itself an exponent. So we get the exponent of an exponent of beta mu minus epsilon j. Here I have repeated that expression and now if we want to know what the average occupation is of nj then we can calculate simply the derivative of the logarithm of z grand with respect to beta epsilon j and it's easy to see that that is e to the power and that should have a minus sign and that's e to the power beta mu minus epsilon j and so that is a kind of uh, ordinary Boltzmann factor, e to the power minus beta ej.